When WCW was great, it was fantastic. When WCW was bad, well, we had poor Judy Bagwell on a forklift, Viagra on a pole, and Rick Steiner calling out Chucky of Child's Play fame. Since WCW closed its doors, there's been plentiful time for certain facts and slices of trivia to come to the fore. I'm Andrew from What Culture Wrestling, and here are 10 secrets nobody has told you about WCW. Number 10. The bite that changed the course of wrestling history. Sure, the Austin era and the wider energy and electricity of the Attitude Era is what drove the World Wrestling Federation on its way to toppling WCW. But one other key figure in WWF success back then was Mike Tyson. Of course, Iron Mike was brought in as the Shawn Michaels biased enforcer for the Heartbreak Kids WrestleMania 14 match against the Rising Stone Cold. The appearances of the legendary boxer brought a whole bunch of fresh mainstream eyes to the WWF product, and that magnetism between Tyson and Austin likewise showcased Stone Cold in an impressive light. Oh, how things could have been so different though. As detailed on the Something to Wrestle podcast, Mike Tyson was supposed to appear on the 30th of June 1997 episode of WCW Nitro. An episode of Nitro that took place just two days after Mike Tyson took an Evander Holyfield for a second time. Of course, this was the fight where Tyson bit part of Holyfield's ear off, which subsequently saw Tyson's WCW appearance cancelled. Number 9. A fledgling phenomenal one. While many savvy wrestling fans will clearly be well aware of the Phenomenal One's time with New Japan Pro Wrestling, TNA, and Ring of Honor, a portion of those knowledgeable fans may be completely unaware that AJ Styles ever stepped foot in a WCW ring. Just 23 years of age at this point, AJ landed in WCW at the start of 2001, dubbed Air Styles, and teamed up with Air Paris to form Air Raid. The future WWE Champion competed four times on WCW television before the company closed its doors, even competing on the final ever episode of WCW Thunder. Of those four matches, all of them were tag team outings and only one against the Boogie Knights pairing of Das Wunderkid, Alex Wright and Disco Inferno was a victory. Number 8. Those early 90s entrance themes. There may well never have been a finer time for wrestling entrance themes than during the early 90s landscape of WCW. Seriously, for Sting alone he had two absolute bangers in the form of Turbocharged and Man Called Sting. Elsewhere, Ricky Steamboat, The Steiners, Lex Luger, Ron Simmons, Big Van Vader, Two Cold Scorpio, Marcus Alexander Bagwell, The Hollywood Blondes, Dangerous Alliance, and of course, anything Four Horsemen related, all had truly magnificent songs during the first half of the 90s. And then, well then, there was Ravishing Rick Rude. Seriously, not just his Rude simply ravishing WCW theme a favourite in the What Culture office, it's legitimately one of the finest entrance songs to ever grace the wrestling business. He'll steal your girl, break her heart, and leave you a fool. Van Flubbintastic from singer Pat Peterson on this absolute masterpiece. Go and check it out. Number 7. The training ground of the Great Kali. Whereas you may be surprised to realise AJ Styles competed in WCW, it's even more shocking to learn that the Great Kali spent 8 months honing his craft under the WCW banner. Having made his wrestling debut for US Indie Promotion or Pro Wrestling in 2000, the hulking frame of the real life Dalip Singh was quickly signed up by WCW. Following in the footsteps of major stars such as Bill Goldberg and Paul White, Singh was assigned to the promotion's power plant training facility. The 7 foot 1 monster didn't have the opportunity to make an appearance on WCW TV before his time there came to a close, and in terms of that came to a close, Singh actually remained with WCW up until the organisation was assimilated by the WWF in early 2001. Following that buyout, the juggernaut headed to Japan and joined New Japan Pro Wrestling, immediately forming a humongous tag team with the 7 foot 2 Giant Silver before Carly would sign with WWE 5 years later. Number 6. The Truth About Lanny Poffo's WCW Contract One of the many, many stories of the daft amounts of money being thrown around in WCW during the second half of the 90s is that Lanny Poffo was paid by WCW to sit at home for four years. While this is strictly true, there's a little more to the tale than Lanny being a pointless financial outlay for WCW back then. As detailed by Poffo in several interviews, yes, he was paid by WCW for four years without ever working a single show for them, but this was balanced out by what his brother Randy Savage brought to the table. Notably, the Macho Man brought a $750,000 agreement with Slim Jim with him to WCW, which, let's face it, more than offset the 
cost of having Lani contracted to Ted Turner's promotion. Elsewhere, Eric Bischoff has since noted on his 83 Weeks podcast how, unbeknownst to Lani, Randy also agreed to be paid less in order to accommodate the outlay of his brother's contract. Number 5. Team Canada Phone Home Having arrived in WCW in June 2000, Lance Stone soon won the WCW United States Championship, the WCW Cruiserweight Championship and the WCW Hardcore Championship, all of which he renamed as part of Storm's time heading up Team Canada. While many fans are still irked to this day that the Calgary native was never given the opportunity to become a world champion during his career, things could have been so, so much worse for the former Impact player. You see, as detailed by Storm himself on Twitter in 2019, there was at one point creative discussions of revealing that Team Canada were actually aliens. Yes, this was real discussions that really happened. Ah, <sighs> WCW, man. It's worth noting that these tentative plans came at a time when Vince Russo and Disco Inferno were on the creative team, and thankfully for Storm and his Team Canada buddies, such an idiotic concept never made it to WCW television. Oh man, and we wonder why this company went out of business. Number four, Stunning Steve was better than Stone Cold. Hear me out here. Under the guise of Stone Cold, Steve Austin became the hottest star of the hottest period in wrestling history. Still, his work as a Texas redneck isn't a patch on Austin's time being stunning. Of course, this is not to say that Stone Cold Steve Austin wasn't one of the most captivating, iconic, money-drawing figures to ever lace up a pair of boots. Flipping the bird, drinking beers, and hitting stunners. Anyone daring to dispute the legacy of Stone Cold is clearly an utter idiot. The point being made here, though, is that stunning Steve Austin was a far better worker than Stone Cold Steve Austin. During his stunning days in WCW, Austin was a special in-ring mechanic. Whether as a singles act, as part of the Hollywood Blondes, or as part of the Dangerous Alliance, the future WWE Hall of Famer had a style that made him stand out from the pack. It may sound like an extremely minor detail, but just go back and watch some of those matches from Austin and marvel at how he hits the ropes. Such a simple thing, but the aggression, the snap, the crispness, it's a genuine joy to behold. Against the likes of Ricky Steamboat, the Great Muta, Sting, Brian Pillman, the team of Ric Flair and Arn Anderson, and against Sting's squadron in the greatest War Games match in history, Austin was at his in-ring best during those WCW days. Neck and knee issues clearly would force a change to Austin's work as Stone Cold started to catch fire, but his WCW tenure serves as a prime example of how phenomenal a technical in-ring worker Steve Austin once was. Number 3. The Warriors of Kiss Yes, you may well remember the Kiss Demon from WCW's final few years, but chances are you won't be aware that the Demon was merely intended to be the first of a group of wrestlers named, you guessed it, the Warriors of Kiss. Each of these grapplers would have been handpicked by a member of Kiss to represent them in an in-ring action. Clearly, the Kiss Demon played by Dale Torberg was in homage to Gene Simmons and his iconic demon alter ego, and one has to presume that the other Warriors of Kiss would have represented the Star Child, the Catman, and of course the Space Ace. The agreement between Kiss and WCW was overseen by Eric Bischoff, with the promise being that Torberg's demon would main event a pay-per-view ahead of the Warriors of Kiss becoming a faction. Unfortunately for all involved, Bischoff was out of power by the time the Kiss demon actually debuted, so as a result of this contractual main event, Super Brawl 2000 featured the Kiss demon taking on the wall in what was billed as a special main event, which was so special, it was the fourth match on an 11 match card, lasted for less than four minutes, and ended in a loss for the demon. Number two, the pay-per-view that never was. Prior to the company being purchased by the WWF, Eric Bischoff was very much in the driving seat to lead a buyout of WCW. So much so, Easy e began to map out a pay-per-view called The Big Bang, which would have served as a relaunch of World Championship Wrestling. The Big Bang was even advertised in the second to last issue of WCW magazine, and Bischoff has since detailed the tentative plans for this new WCW. After taking a brief hiatus, WCW would have returned on the 6th of May 2001 with The Big Bang. That pay-per-view would usher in a revitalized WCW with ECW favorite Joey Styles and the then fired from WWF Jerry Lawler earmarked to lead the commentary booth. Heavy hitters such as Goldberg, Hulk Hogan, Sting and DDP, they were all penciled in as the headline talent and Bischoff and his fusion backers were even hopeful of running crossover shows with the World Wrestling Federation. Upon Turner Broadcasting CEO Jamie Kellner deciding that Turner was to move in a direction away from pro wrestling, well that left Bischoff and Fusion with the unviable option of purchasing a WCW that had zero television commitments, which in turn left the deal and the Big Bang relaunch dead in the water as Vince McMahon instead swooped in. Number 1. Early 90s WCW was better than the Monday Night Wars WCW. When reflecting back on when WCW was at the peak of its powers, many will offer up the famed NWO-driven Monday Night Wars period as being the very best of Ted Turner's wrestling promotion. Sure, those years 
years featured some phenomenal moments and matches, and yes, WCW did beat the WWF for a mammoth 83 weeks in the ratings, but the reality is WCW was a better product at the start of that decade. Going back and looked at the first few years of the 90s, it was a fantastic time to be a fan of WCW. Not only was Sting utterly tearing it up as one of the greatest energetic baby faces the industry has ever seen, but the WCW poster boy was surrounded by so much other awesomeness. On the tag team front, you had pairings such as the Steiner Brothers, Doom, Harlem Heat, the Road Warriors, the Enforcers, the Nasty Boys, the Midnight Express, the Rock and Roll Express, the Fabulous Freebirds, the Southern Boys, Terry Gordy and Steve Williams, the Hollywood Blondes, and the Majestic, but brief pairing of Arn Anderson and beautiful Bobby Eaton. In the singles ranks, the main event scene was dripping with star power, with Ric Flair, Nikita Koloff, Lex Luger, Sid Vicious, Big Van Vader, Ravishing Rick Rude, Barry Windham, Ricky Steamboat, Paul Orndorff, Cactus Jack, Ron Simmons, and Davey Boy Smith, all getting some time in the main event spotlight alongside the Stinger. Even taking a look lower down the card, this period had rising stars such as Stunning Steve Austin, Lord Steven Regal, Brian Pillman, Dustin Rhodes, Two Code Scorpio, Marcus Alexander Bagwell, yes, really at that point in time, Johnny B. Bad, Scotty Flamengo, and even sporadic appearances from the legendary Jushin Thunder Liger. Simply put, from the start of the 90s through until the arrival of Hulk Hogan, WCW was ridiculously fun and featured some of the very best wrestling on the planet. Plus, you know, in someone like Vader, the promotion had a genuinely fear-inducing monster who made for the perfect foil to WCW's babyface roster. So, there are our 10 secrets nobody has told you about WCW. Be sure to like, subscribe, comment, share, turn those notification bells on, and come and give us a follow on Twitter at WhatCultureWWE. While you're there, you can find myself at CulturedLeftPeg. And most importantly though, be sure to have the best possible day. Whether you're doing something or whether you're doing absolutely nothing, I hope it goes well for you. And if things aren't going so well, I hope they turn around as soon as possible. I've been Andrew Pollard from What Culture Wrestling and I'll catch you down the road.